we've already seen a little bit of chemical reactions because they're really just different than physical reactions, or in other words, physical changes. We saw at the very beginning of the quarter that a physical change is any process where you start with one compound or substance and you end with the same compound or the same substance, but its physical state has changed. So an example would be you start with H2O in its liquid form, which we think of as water, and you heat it up till you have H2O in its gas form, which we think of as steam. Since you start with H2O and end with H2O, and the only difference is the physical state of these substances, that's an example of a physical change. Chemical changes, or chemical reactions, are ones where instead of starting and ending with the same substance, you end with different substances. Take, for example, starting with H2 gas, that's hydrogen gas. If you react H2 gas with oxygen gas, or O2, you can actually form H2O in the liquid form. Notice that we have different compounds on the left side of the arrow than we do on the right side of the arrow. This is how we know a chemical change, or in other words, a chemical reaction has occurred. We have at least one new chemical compound that's been produced during the process. Sometimes we'll see one new chemical compound, sometimes there'll be many more than that, but the definition of a chemical reaction or a chemical change is that we have a new substance when the process has finished. The way that we express information about chemical reactions is in the form of a chemical equation. Much like in math, you use equations to represent information in symbolic form. We do the same thing in chemistry with a chemical equation. To give you a short, simple example, we'll work with the one that I've just put in front of you. This is the reaction between H2 gas, that's hydrogen gas, and O2 gas, or oxygen gas, making liquid water. This is a good example of a chemical reaction. And as a chemical reaction, which I've just written in front of you in the equation form, it's got a bunch of things that we can look at. In most chemical equations, and definitely all the ones that you'll be working with this quarter, the first thing to notice is that we show all of what are called the reactants and the products in the reaction. The reactants, or the species that react, are what you'll see on the left side of the equation, or the left side of the arrow. The products, or the species that have been made during the reaction, are always shown on the right side of the arrow. Now in this case, we have two different reactants, H2 and O2, and we have one product, H2O. That's very, very common to have a different number of reactants and products. You might have two or three or four reactants, and you might have two or three or four products, or even more. So it'll vary from equation to equation and reaction to reaction. Another thing you might notice about this are those little letters or subscripts that are after each of the chemical formulas. Those are what we call the physical states of the reaction. And just like the physical states we've studied already this quarter, it can be helpful to know what physical state a compound is in during a reaction. So those subscripts indicate the physical state of that chemical compound. We tend to use S, L, and G for solids, liquids, and gas. It's pretty obvious, although you may notice at times liquid is often represented with a cursive L. The reason is sometimes a printed L looks a lot like a 1 or an I. So this just helps people distinguish from any, to avoid confusion. So solids are S, liquids are L, gases are G, and you'll also sometimes run into the physical state AQ. AQ, which stands for aqueous, just means that that substance is dissolved in water. So you'll see in this chemical equation, I have my reactants on the left side, my products on the right side, and I also have the physical states. So I know that the H2 is in gas form, the O2 is in gas form, and the H2O is in liquid form. There's one other aspect to most chemical equations that you'll see, and that's that the chemical equation is not violating something called the conservation of mass principle. What the law of conservation of mass says, it can be stated in several different ways, but the easiest way, I think, is to think of it as matter cannot be created or destroyed. So the law of conservation of mass means that whatever you start with, you have to end with or you can't make something appear or disappear into thin air. 
that applies to your garbage, that applies to your laundry, even when the socks go missing, you know they had to go somewhere, and it also applies to chemical equations. What it essentially means in a chemical equation is that we can't make atoms appear or disappear during the chemical reaction. We can change those atoms into different compounds and different substances, but they can't actually appear or disappear. What that means on an atomic level is that we have to account for all of the atoms on the left side of the equation and the right side of it. And if you look closely at this chemical equation, you'll see that that's where we run into a problem. This equation has some atoms that actually go missing from the left side to the right side. So let's look carefully at this equation. On the left side, I have H2 gas, which is made of two hydrogen atoms. I also have O2 gas, which is made of two oxygen atoms. On the right side, I have H2O, which as you can see from the chemical formula, it has two hydrogen atoms, and it only has one oxygen atom. So when you compare the left side of the equation to the right side, you'll notice that one of our oxygen atoms has gone missing. This is not a good thing. This means this chemical equation is unbalanced. It doesn't account for all the atoms on the left side or the right side. And occasionally you'll run into unbalanced equations, but they are a little bit limited in the information they give us because they're essentially like having a list of ingredients but no recipe. What we're going to see is it's up to us often to balance equations, meaning to find out where all the atoms came from and where all the atoms went. So let's look at how to balance equations. There's a lot of different techniques out there for balancing a chemical equation, so I'm going to call this balancing equations the J. Hopkins way, because this is the way that I started doing it when I was in school that I thought was the fastest and most efficient way. The equation that we're going to balance first is the same equation we've been working with, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas combining to make water. The first thing we do if we're going to balance equations the J. Hopkins way is to figure out what the identity of each atom you have is and write it under the arrow. In this case, on my reactant side, or on the left side of the arrow, I see that I have hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. So I'm going to write that down under the arrow. I have some hydrogen atoms and some oxygen atoms. On the product side, I should have the same atoms, even if I have a different count. If there's a brand new atom on the product side, you've got larger issues, and you should probably look more carefully or at least ask for help. So now that I've written the identity of all the atoms involved in this reaction under the arrow, my next step is to tally up how many of each atom I have on each side. So let's start with the reactant side. I know that I have hydrogen atoms on the left side, but how many different hydrogen atoms do we see? Well, the subscript 2 tells me that I have two hydrogen atoms, so I'll write that next to my hydrogen. My oxygens, I can count, also have two because of the two subscript. So on the left side of the reaction, I have two hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms total. On the product side, or the right side of the reaction, I have an H2O molecule, which when we look at the chemical formula has two hydrogens and one oxygen. So I'm done with step two. I've just tallied the types of atoms on each side. Now, here's where I'm going to actually balance the equation. What I want to do is tinker around with what are called the coefficients for the reaction. The coefficients are simply numbers that go in front of each chemical species that indicate how many of that species I have. Let me show you an example. In this reaction, I have hydrogen gas, and I have oxygen gas, and my product is liquid water. When I look at that, I have not yet figured out how many hydrogen gases, how many oxygen gases, and how many waters I have. In fact, the way this is written, there's an implied one in front of each of these boxes. So I have a one saying one hydrogen and one oxygen makes one water. And if that's actually the coefficients, it would balance the equation, meaning I would have noticed that I have all the same atoms. The fact that I went missing, or an oxygen atom went missing during the equation, means I have to change those coefficients. 
So what I would recommend doing is increase the coefficient in front of just one species at a time. In this case, when we look critically at our tally, you'll notice that we're short on oxygen atoms on my product side. Oxygen on the product side is part of the water molecule, H2O, and I can't change the chemical formula of H2O. Instead, what I'm going to do is change the number in front of H2O. So let's just increase it by one. I'm going to cross out the one, and I'm going to change it to a number two. Now that I've done this, I'm going to re-tally my atoms and see if that's fixed my problem. So everything on the left side, or the reactant side, has stayed the same. But I've just changed the number of atoms on the product side because I've doubled the number of water molecules. Now when I count up my total number of atoms, I see that I have 2 times 2, or a total of 4 hydrogens, and I have 2 times 1, or a total of 2 oxygens. So see how I distributed the 2 to each of the atoms in that equation, multiplying by subscripts when necessary. Now, what do you notice about our tally? Our oxygens now match. I now have accounted for all my oxygen atoms, but I threw my hydrogen atom count off while doing that. No problem. Just continue increasing coefficients and retallying until everything works out. Most chemical equations require two or three steps to balance. Occasionally you'll run into one that requires just one step, and very, very rarely you'll run into something that requires even more steps. So I now need more hydrogens on the reactant side because I have two hydrogens on the left side and four hydrogens on the right. When I find my hydrogen atoms on the reactant side, they're part of H2 gas. Again, I cannot change the chemical formula for H2 gas. I can't change the information in that box. But what I can do is change how many H2 gas molecules I have. So instead of one H2 gas molecule, let's try having two H2 gas molecules. Now I'm going to retally, recount my numbers. I now have two H2 gas molecules, so that's two times two for a total of four atoms of hydrogen. I haven't changed the number of O2 molecules, and I haven't changed anything on my product side. If you look now at your tally, you'll see that this equation is balanced. In other words, the number of hydrogen atoms on the left side matches the number of hydrogen atoms on the right side. And the number of oxygen atoms on the left side matches the number of oxygen atoms on the right side. I'm going to take a second and rewrite this just to clean it up a little so you can see how good this information actually is. If I go and erase all my work, all my little scribbles, take all of this out, I'll notice that what I've essentially done is said, take two H2 gas molecules and one O2 gas molecule, and you'll make two water molecules. Again, balancing equations is very similar to taking a list of ingredients and turning it into a recipe. This reaction involved H2, O2, and H2O, but to actually do the reaction, I need two H2 molecules and one O2 molecule, and I will make two molecules of H2O. Let's try another slightly more difficult example. Okay, so take a second, try this chemical reaction. This chemical reaction shows CH4, which is methane gas, reacting with oxygen gas to make carbon dioxide and water molecules. This is essentially the reaction that happens every time you combust or burn natural gas, which is methane. Pause the video at this point and see how far you can get in balancing it. Okay, so let's go through each individual step to try to balance this equation. First, I'm going to write the identity of all the atoms I'm working with under my arrow. I see that I have carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and oxygen atoms. And it doesn't matter what order you write them in. Now I'm going to tally how many of each atom I have on each side. On my reactant side, or the left side, I have one carbon atom, I have four hydrogen atoms, and I have two oxygen atoms. 
On the right side, I still have one carbon atom. I have two hydrogen atoms. And be careful here, because I have two oxygens in the carbon dioxide and one oxygen in the H2O. So that's a grand total of three oxygen atoms on the entire product side. Now I'm going to increase the coefficients one by one until I get the equation balanced. One thing you can do while you do this, as long as you're a little nervous, go ahead and put boxes around each species to remind yourself that you can't change anything in that box. You can't change chemical formulas. You can just adjust coefficients. OK, so when I look critically at my tally, I notice two things are wrong. While my carbons are fine from the left side to the right side, I have four hydrogens on the reactant side and two hydrogens on the product side. So I'm going to have to mess with or tinker with my number of hydrogens. My oxygen atoms, I have two on the left side, but three on the right side. So again, I'll have to tinker with my number of oxygens. Technically, you can start with either atom. But what you might notice is our oxygen is on the left side all alone. In other words, it's just O2 gas. Whereas my hydrogen is part of a more complex molecule. It's part of H2O on the right side. So I'm going to start with the more complex molecule because I wouldn't want to get that number of O2s perfect just to mess it up when I go to adjust my hydrogens. All right, so let's look at hydrogen first. I have four hydrogens on the left side, two hydrogens on the right side. So I'm going to increase the coefficient in front of my hydrogen to try to bring it up to four. I go to the water molecule, which is where my hydrogen is. It has an implied one in front of it, and I'll go ahead and change it to two. Now I retally. I now have a total of, on my right side, still one carbon. Now I have two times two, or four hydrogen. And now be careful with your oxygen total, because remember the oxygen atoms are in both molecules. I have two oxygens in carbon dioxide, and I have two times one oxygen for two oxygens from the water. So this is a grand total of four oxygens. Now I have my hydrogens balanced, but not my oxygen. So as usual, I'm just going to keep working. I need more oxygens on the left side. My oxygen is part of O2. There's an implied 1 in front of the molecule right now, so I'll go ahead and increase that to a 2. When I do that, I now retally the left side. I still have 1 carbon. I still have 4 hydrogens. And now I have 2 times 2, or a total of 4 oxygens. So the balanced chemical reaction here is take one molecule of methane gas and two molecules of O2 gas, and you can react those to form one molecule of carbon dioxide and two molecules of water. Now we're going to look at one of the stranger topics. And if you've ever had chemistry before, you probably remember hearing about the mole. If you haven't had chemistry before, you're probably wondering why I just started talking about a small, fuzzy animal that lives in the ground. And the answer is, I'm not. The mole is something different in chemistry. The mole is just a unit that we use in order to count molecules. Why do we need a unit to count molecules? Why can't I just count them? One, two, three, four. Well, the reason lies in the fact that molecules are so very tiny. So if I was going to count one, two, three, four molecules, I would have to be doing it on a really small level, and it's not a very efficient way to go about things. Let me show you how that works in the real world. Let's say, for example, that you've been tasked with coming up with some samples of aspirin. Perhaps you want to sell it to make money. Aspirin, which has the chemical formula C9H8O4, is actually pretty easy to make. One way that we can make it, and actually we can make it in our lab here on campus, is by combining a compound called salicylic acid with another compound called acetic anhydride. As you can see, these are larger compounds than what we normally work with. But when you combine these two compounds together under the right conditions, you'll make aspirin. You also make a byproduct, C2H4O2, which we don't need to worry about right now. Now, based on what we've learned so far, 
I can tell you that this equation, if you add up all those different atoms, is actually balanced exactly as it's written. In other words, there's an implied one in front of each chemical compound, and that's the correct way for this equation to be written to show it being balanced. So our chemical equation shows us that our recipe is really one molecule of salicylic acid and one molecule of acetic anhydride will produce one molecule of aspirin, as well as one molecule of my byproduct. Now, here's why we need the mole. Let's say you really were going to produce aspirin for the marketplace. If you wanted to produce something like a tablet of aspirin, maybe for somebody's low-dose aspirin regimen, most patients on a low-dose aspirin regimen require a tablet that contains 81 milligrams of aspirin. If you wanted to produce that aspirin, you would need to produce about 2.7 times 10 to the 20 aspirin molecules. That's a very large number. And that's the number of aspirin molecules in just one 81 milligram tablet. So imagine if you're trying to mix this recipe up, how are you going to know how much salicylic acid and how much acetic anhydride to mix together? Our stoichiometry, or our balanced reaction, tells us that one salicylic acid molecule reacts with one acetic anhydride molecule, or two salicylic acids will react with two acetic anhydrides, or three salicylic acids will react with three acetic anhydrides. But I really don't have time to sit around and count out 2.7 times 10 to the 20 salicylic acid molecules, just so that I know exactly how much aspirin I'm going to make. If I did that, it would take a really long time, and I probably would be a pretty frustrated person by the end of it. So this is where the mole comes in. If we're going to be working with tiny little molecules, and we need to know exactly how many molecules we have, it's helpful to have a larger way to measure them. So when you think about the mole, as much as we like to think about a cute little fuzzy animal that lives in the ground, don't think about it that way in chemistry. What the mole is, first of all, is like a really big version of saying a dozen. So when you say one molecule, you mean one molecule. When you say one dozen molecules, you really mean 12 molecules. But see how you were able to say 12 without needing to actually count all the way up to 12? Well, that's the same idea with the mole. When we say one dozen, we mean 12. When we say one mole, we mean a huge number. We mean 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. It's a little awkward to say that number, and of course we always write it in scientific notation because it is so big, but you can call this Avogadro's number. It was named after one of the first scientists to recognize that a lot of chemistry is based on the number of molecules that are involved. So treat a mole like the word dozen, except with a very big number. One dozen means 12. One mole means 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So if you have one dozen donuts, you have 12 donuts. If you have one mole of donuts, you would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd donuts. That's a lot of donuts. But if you have one mole of atoms, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. In other words, you've just counted a huge number of atoms, and you still are using a nice small number, one mole. If you have one mole of molecules, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So think of the word mole as just being a very big version of a dozen. So one more thing about the mole. Why is it this strange number? Why is it 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd? Why don't we just say one mole means a million or a billion? Well, it seems like that might be a little bit easier, Believe it or not, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, Avogadro's number, is that number because it makes calculations really easy. And it's actually because it's related to the weight of these atoms and the weight of molecules. Take a second and look at your periodic table. When you find the periodic table, go ahead and find carbon on there, atomic number 6. Depending on exactly which version of the periodic table you're looking at, you'll find that the weight of carbon is listed somewhere in that box with the letter C, and it's probably about 
It might have more digits, it might have less, but let's say it's 12.01. That's really 12.01 atomic mass units. But notice on the periodic table, you never see units. And that's because 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd was chosen so that we can continue using that same number, that same weight, even when we count large numbers of molecules. So one single tiny little carbon atom weighs 12.01 AMU. But one gigantic huge collection of carbon atoms called a mole, one mole of carbon atoms, is 12.01 grams. So the reason we use 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd is not because somebody chose that number. It's because that's how many molecules or how many atoms you need to get up to the same number just in the much more measurable units of grams. So one mole of carbon atoms weighs 12.01 grams. And guess what? If you take carbon off the shelf in the lab and you weigh out 12.01 grams of it, I guarantee you, you have one mole of carbon. Or in other words, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of carbon. Look at that, you didn't even have to count a single molecule. You just got to weigh it on a balance and you instantly know how many molecules you have. This is what we call the molecular weight of carbon. And don't confuse it with the atomic mass. Molecular weight should think you, make you think of the word mole. And we usually express it, it's always in grams, but you also see it expressed in grams per mole. In other words, there's 12.01 grams in one mole. And that actually will become helpful because notice that begins to look a little bit like a conversion factor. It's a fraction. So there's 12.01 grams in one mole, and that's the molecular weight, or the MW, for carbon. Now molecular weight applies not just to single atoms like carbon, but also to entire molecules. So if you want to weigh out carbon, you can look up its mass on the periodic table, and you can use that to figure out how much you have to weigh out to get a certain number of molecules. But you can do the exact same thing when you have gigantic molecules or more complex molecules. Let's look at an example that you're probably comfortable with. If you find hydrogen on your periodic table, the molecular weight of hydrogen is 1.01 grams per mole. Again, you might have a few more decimal places or less decimal places depending on your version of the periodic table. And the molecular weight of oxygen is also to easy, easy to find. It's about 15.99 grams per mole. But what about if I want to know the molecular weight of water? Well, just like you might expect, all we need to do is scale this up based on the chemical formula of water. When I look at H2O, there's two hydrogens in that formula. So I'm going to take the molecular weight of a single hydrogen and multiply it by 2 to get the contribution of hydrogen to the molecular weight of water. So 2 times 1.01 grams per mole. Now I also have one oxygen atom, so I'm going to take that 15.99 grams per mole and I'm going to add that to those two hydrogens. My grand total when I'm all done is that the molecular weight of water is 18.01 grams per mole. One note on significant figures and decimal places, you can always err on the side of caution here by picking as many decimal places as you can. So if your periodic table has a lot of decimal places, it's always okay to use all of them. As we'll see when you use these in calculations, just be sure you don't round too much when you take numbers from the periodic table because you don't want to end up limiting your own answer because you didn't take enough decimal places. And we'll see an example coming up. Okay, so now we understand the idea of the mole and where molecular weight comes from. If I have 18.01 grams of hydrogen, or pardon me, of water, 18.01 grams of water is the same as saying one mole of water. And it's the same as saying 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. So in fact, if you weigh out your glass of water in front of you that you have you know, at home in your kitchen, weigh that out, figure out how many grams it is, you can actually calculate how many molecules of water are in that glass. 
it'll be a really big number, but you can do it. The main reason this is so important is exactly that. In science, especially in chemistry, we work with things that are so small that we're not going to be able to see them and count them out. We need to be able to weigh them to get important information. And the nice thing is, between molecular weight and stoichiometry, or balanced equations, we can do a lot of useful math relating to our different chemical reactions. One thing that we can calculate is very important. It's called the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is probably the first question you would ask if someone told you they're doing a reaction. The answer is, or the question is, what do you make? Well, your theoretical yield is the amount of product you can theoretically make when you know how much of the re reactants you start with. So again, think about this as a recipe. If I know how many cups of flour I have in my cupboard at home, assuming I have all the other ingredients, I can calculate theoretically how many chocolate chip cookies I can make, or how many loaves of bread I could bake, or how many pancakes I could cook. That would be a theoretical yield. I know what I have, so theoretically I should be able to calculate what I can make. This is the same thing that happens in chemistry labs all over the world. Let's look at an example involving that aspirin reaction that we saw earlier. Let's say somebody hands you 275 grams of salicylic acid. We saw earlier that salicylic acid is one of the reactants that's needed to produce aspirin. So, if someone gives you 275 grams of salicylic acid, assuming you have everything else you need, how much aspirin can you actually make? You can answer this question in just a few steps using your newfound knowledge of molecular weight as well as balanced equations. Let's look at how to do this. Okay, so you have 275 grams of salicylic acid and you're trying to figure out how much aspirin you can make. There's really three things you're going to need in order to calculate your theoretical yield. Remember, theoretical yield is theoretically how much stuff can you make. The first thing is you're going to need a recipe. You're going to want to know how do I make aspirin out of salicylic acid? How much salicylic acid do I need to make aspirin? So your recipe in chemistry is just your balanced chemical equation. So here's your balanced chemical equation for making aspirin from salicylic acid. And remember, it's balanced as written, so one molecule of salicylic acid reacts with one molecule of acetic anhydride to make one molecule of aspirin. In this case, we're going to assume that we have plenty of my other reactant, acetic anhydride. In science, that's often called an excess of your reactant. In other words, you're not limited to how much you can make by one of your reactants. So I have my balanced chemical equation, and it tells me for every one molecule of salicylic acid, I can make one molecule of aspirin. In other words, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. But if I can use one molecule of salicylic acid to make one molecule of aspirin, I now have to know how many molecules are in 275 grams of salicylic acid. This is where the molecular weight comes in. I can use the molecular weight of my reactant, in this case salicylic acid, to figure out how many molecules or how many moles of salicylic acid I have. So often your first step is actually going to be using the molecular weight from the periodic table, which you can calculate, to figure out how many moles you make. Your final step is pretty much the reverse of that, which is once you know how many molecules or how many moles of aspirin you can make, you have to figure out how much that will actually weigh. So your molecular weight of your product is your third step. This basically means you have a three-step reaction on your hands, or a three-step calculation. And that's really the best way to think about these type of equations, is as three steps. I know that I have 275 grams of salicylic acid, so I'm going to start by writing that information, including the chemical formula. There can be a lot of different chemical formulas in an equation, so it's important that we always know which one we're working with in a calculation. Now my first step is to figure out if I have 275 grams of salicylic acid, how many molecules is that? The only thing is if I were to convert to molecules at this point, I'd have a very large number on my hands. So remember, so that we don't have to work with really large numbers of molecules, we just work in terms of moles. 
My first step is going to be to convert from grams to moles. Like all conversions, I put what I don't want on the side that's going to make it cancel. In this case, I need grams on the bottom. So I'll write grams of C7H6O3 on the bottom and moles of C7H6O3 on the top. I'm going to continue writing that chemical compounds formula, even though it seems a little tedious, just so that I know I'm working with the correct numbers. The relationship between grams and moles, as you'll recall, is called molecular weight, and it comes from the periodic table. So when you look at the periodic table, the mass in grams of one mole of C7H6O3 is simply the mass of carbon seven times over plus the mass of hydrogen times six plus the mass of oxygen times three. If you take a second and add those up, you can even pause the video right now, seven carbons plus six hydrogens plus three oxygens should give you a total of about 140.1 grams. Notice that I'm careful about how much I round this number. You can always have more decimal places, but because the number I start with in this calculation, 275, has three sig figs, I want to make sure I have at least three sig figs in all of the numbers I pull from the periodic table. Here I have four, just to play it on the safe side, and that's fine. So this was my first step. My first step was the conversion from grams to moles of salicylic acid. Now I'm on my second step. Now that I've figured out how many moles of salicylic acid I have, let's relate that to how many moles of aspirin I can make. This is a lot like figuring out if I have three cups of flour at home, how many chocolate chip cookies can I make? Just like with all conversions, I put the thing I want to cancel on the bottom, so moles of C7H6O3, and I'm trying to relate that moles of salicylic acid to moles of aspirin. So I'm still going to be in terms of moles, but now my chemical formula will be that of aspirin, which I can see is C9H8O4. The relationship between moles of one species and moles of another is the stoichiometry, and that comes from the balanced equation. So I'm literally just going to read this information from the balanced equation. I find aspirin, and I see that there's an implied 1 in front of it. So I'll put a 1 in that space in the equation. Then I find salicylic acid, C7H6O3. And again, there's an implied 1, so I'll put a 1 here. While this example has 1 to 1 reactions, be sure you always include this step, because most chemical reactions will have 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 4 to 8, or any other type of relationship. So this was my second step, relating moles of what I knew to moles of what I'm trying to figure out. I'm now 66.66% of the way done with this equation. My final step is now that I know how many moles of aspirin I have, let's turn that into a mass of aspirin. The easiest one to use is grams. So one more conversion factor. Again, to make everything cancel correctly, I'll put moles of C9H8O4 on the bottom, and I'm going to change this to grams of C9H8O4. The relationship between grams to moles is always the molecular weight and is always found on the periodic table. So in step three, I go from moles of aspirin to grams of aspirin, and this information comes from the periodic table, much like it did for step one. So in one mole of C9H8O4, there are nine carbons, eight hydrogens, and four oxygens. If you'd like to pause the video, see if you can calculate and correctly round that number now. The molecular weight of aspirin, when I add it up, is 180.2 grams in one mole. If you have more decimal places, that's fine, but make sure you don't have fewer than three significant figures. Now when I look back at this calculation, I've gone through my three steps. I started with grams of salicylic acid, I converted from grams to moles of salicylic acid, then I related the moles of salicylic acid to moles of aspirin, and finally I went from moles of aspirin to grams of aspirin. When you multiply across the top and divide across the bottom, you should come up with an answer close to 353.7. But to round, I want to round to the fewest number of sig figs, because this is a multiplication division problem. I started with three sig figs, 
I was careful not to overround any of my other numbers, so I'm going to round to three sig figs. The answer to this question is 354 grams of aspirin, which is C9H8O4. There's a couple things to notice about this. First of all, it was three steps. So on the downside, it was three steps. On the upside, it was only three steps. And it, believe it or not, in these conversions, over and over and over again, they're going to be the same three steps. So while this is a lot of new information right now, I can promise you that it's just going to seem like the same thing over and over. A lot like riding a bike can be intimidating at first, but by now we can all ride bikes and it's not very scary. A couple other things about these conversions. Notice I only changed one part of my units at a time. So when you look at the units for each conversion, you may have changed from grams to moles, or you may have stayed in moles to moles, but only one part can change. So in each part where I changed from grams to moles, like the molecular weight of salicylic acid, if I'm going to change from one unit to another, my chemical formula needs to stay the same from the top to the bottom. The only time my chemical formula can change is when I'm relating moles to moles. And that's one way that you can help yourself remember not to leave out any important steps in these conversions. The other thing about these conversions is that because they are a little bit long, but they really do the same thing over and over again, a lot of people find that if you have a bit of a road map to help you get through this, it can be helpful. So here's one way you can start out doing these, is to have a bit of a road map. That road map really revolves around relating different compounds through a chemical equation. So the chemical equation really tells us the balancing or the stoichiometry of that reaction. And that allows us to relate any two substances in the chemical reaction as long as we have them in terms of moles. So moles of reactants to moles of products, or moles of products to moles of other products, or moles of reactants to moles of reactants. You could ask somebody, if I have 275 grams of salicylic acid, how many moles of acetic anhydride do I need to do the reaction? And then as we saw, because most of the world doesn't work in terms of moles and molecules, we usually have to do a molecular weight conversion to get to grams, or to turn grams into moles. So that exists on both sides. And this is the three-step process we just did. A molecular weight conversion, which came from the periodic table, a stoichiometry conversion, which came from the balanced equation, and another molecular weight conversion from the periodic table. Notice we never actually converted into molecules. We could have, but the downside is it gives you a really big number that isn't actually that useful. We know that Avogadro's number tells us there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in one mole. So if I know how many moles, I can calculate how many molecules, but it's sort of a dead end. There's not really any reason to do it. This road map can be used to get from any point A to point B, and we'll be adding to it more later in the quarter. While you won't have it to refer to most of the time, you can definitely use it as you start to work these problems to, for the first time. Let's try another example of a three-step calculation. I'll give you a question, then you can pause the video and try it on your own. If you get stumped, just hit play, take the video as far as you need till you're not stumped, but make sure you pause it again and see if you can keep going. Here's your question. If I react 15 grams of oxygen according to this reaction, how many grams of water can I theoretically produce? Assume we have an excess, or plenty, of H2. So as you can see in this reaction, there's two molecules of H2 reacting with one molecule of O2 to make two molecules of H2O, and I'm telling you you're starting with 15 grams of oxygen and asking you to calculate how many grams of water. Remember, you can always refer to your road map if you get stuck on where you are and where you're going. Go ahead and pause the video and give it a try. So my first step in this reaction is to start by writing down what I know. I know I have 15 grams of oxygen, and that puts me in this part of my road map. I know grams of something, and what I'm trying to find is how many grams of water. Or in other words, how many grams of something else. So it's going to be a three-step calculation like we've seen earlier. My first step is to go from grams of oxygen to moles of oxygen. So I start my first conversion. I know that what has to go on the bottom of this conversion is grams of O2. 
and I'm trying to relate it to moles of O2. The relationship between grams and moles is always molecular weight and it always comes from the periodic table. So I find oxygen on the periodic table and O2 of course has two oxygens and when I add them up I get a total of 31.998 grams of oxygen per one mole. Again, make sure you don't over round this number. I started with the number 15.0 which has three sig figs so I could round this to three sig figs but it's okay to leave it with a few more decimal places if you're not sure about the rounding. Now I finished my first step. If you want, pause the video if you got stuck and see if you can do the second step. Now that I know how many moles of oxygen I have, my next step is to convert from moles of oxygen to moles of what the question is asking for, which is H2O. So I'm going to relate moles of oxygen, which has to go on the bottom to make these cancel, and I'm going to relate it to moles of water. Remember that in order to change your chemical formula, meaning to change from O2 to H2O, I have to be relating moles to moles. I can't relate grams to moles or grams to grams or anything else. So I look at for this information, it's stoichiometric information, so I'm going to find it in the balanced equation. Let's start with the H2O. I go to H2O and there's a 2 in front of H2O, so I'm going to say for two moles of H2O, and then I find the O2. There's an implied one in front of the O2. So for two moles of H2O, there's one mole of O2. That's my second step. Now I get to continue on. My third and final step is to go from moles of where I am to grams of what I want to find. Or in other words, from moles of water to grams of water. If you didn't already finish this step, pause the video and see if you can do it now. So I write my conversion factor. I have moles of water on the top. I'm going to write moles of water on the bottom. And then I'm going to put grams of water on the top. Again, grams and moles are always related through molecular weight, which is found on the periodic table. P molecular weight is always the number of grams in one mole. So I add up two hydrogens and one oxygen, just like we did in an earlier example and you should calculate that there's 18.01 grams of water in one mole of water. Again, molecular weight is always in one mole. So I'm going to multiply across the top and I'm going to divide across the bottom and you should arrive at a number rounded to three sig figs that is 16.9 grams of H2O. Remember, we want our number of significant figures to match the number that we started with. 15.0 has three sig figs, so I'm going to round my final answer to three sig figs. Also, be sure everything cancels as you go. Grams of oxygen cancels grams of oxygen. Moles of oxygen cancels moles of oxygen. Moles of water cancels moles of water, and I'm left with grams of water, which is what the question asks for. We've just seen several examples where we calculate the theoretical yield. And remember, this is, can be used in a lot of different ways, but the main thing is to figure out how much of something you can make based on what you have to start with. You can just as easily use these exact same calculations to calculate how much of something do you need to start with in order to figure out how much you want to end with. All of those calculations will be done the exact same way. They're all, however, theoretical calculations or theoretical yield because they really just have to do with, in theory, we can calculate what we should make. That's really different from what you do in an experiment where you actually make something. So while you can calculate a theoretical yield, if you go ahead and do a reaction, you'll get what's called an experimental yield. Sometimes it's called the actual yield because it's what you actually get. So you can calculate a theoretical yield but you have to measure the experimental yield, meaning you have to do a reaction and actually measure something to figure out what you made. In science, we're always striving to have good percent yield, meaning if I know how much I should have made and then I weigh out how much I actually made, I'm really hoping that the amounts are the same. But as you probably know from your everyday experience, a lot of times it doesn't work that way. So let's go back to the example from your kitchen. If you have three cups of flour and you calculate out that you can make one dozen cookies with it, what's the likelihood you actually get exactly one dozen cookies from the recipe? 
Well, a lot of things can go wrong. You've got stuff that sticks to the sides of the bowl. You've got a kid or a dog or a spouse that probably steals a little bit from the side. Maybe you burn some, maybe you undercook some. All those things can happen in one way or another in your kitchen. And really similar problems arise when you actually do chemistry in a lab. So scientists often have to report what's called their percent yield. Percent yield is really just what's the percent I made of the total I really could have had. And we calculate percent yield just by dividing our experimental yield by our theoretical. In other words, put the amount that you actually measured on top and the amount that you should have made on the bottom. To get it into a percent, we can multiply times 100. So in the previous example, we calculated out that our our theoretical yield was 16.9 grams of water. In other words, just based on what I started with, theoretically I could have made 16.9 grams of water. But let's say you went ahead and performed this experiment, and in the end of the experiment you measure the amount of water and you only have 11.5 grams. Well, let's look at what your percent yield was. To get your percent yield, you simply need to divide the at your experimental or your actual yield, so 11.5 grams, and divide that by your theoretical yield, 16.9 grams. Multiply by 100 to change it into a percentage, and your sig fig rules remain the same, so you shouldn't change your number of sig figs in this, and you should get 68.0% yield. So in other words, I made about 68% of the water molecules I could have made if my actual yield was 11.5 grams. And probably as a chemist, I'd want to improve that by doing things like measuring more carefully, being more careful about transferring things from one container to another, and other issues like that.